Alright guys, how's it going? So now we're done with the Ryzen 2000 series reviews and we're almost done with the first third of the year which to me has come and gone pretty quickly but I think it's safe to say that maybe six months ago we were looking at the Ryzen 2000 release as being the big release of the year. Certainly nobody appears to be looking forward to much on the graphics front because Nvidia appears to have an unassailable lead. So there's a real lack of maybe excitement around the entire industry you could say. Now that Ryzen 2000 is out there, is there anything else? to really look forward to. And when you've got something like this, you tend to find that the rumour mill goes into overdrive. And what I've decided to do in this video is take a look at some of the rumours going around right now, analyse these rumours for validity, and maybe throw in one or two rumours of my own, which could make for an interesting comparison. So let's get on with it. So let's just stick with the Ryzen 2000. And there's been one or two rumours of maybe a 2800X being held back in reserve. After I looked at this slide, I didn't really like that rumour. And the more I looked into to it, the more I thought, it looks like the 2700X is pretty much tapped out around 4.2 gigahertz, and the reason a 2800X doesn't exist, I mean if you think about it, I talk a lot about semiconductors and how only a certain percentage of chips on the wafer are good enough to cover one say, stock keeping unit. With 12 nanometers being new, obviously there is a bit of immaturity there in the node, but AMD would have looked at a few wafers, looked at the spread of CPUs, the power characteristics, the top speed that they could realistically put into a bin, and they've decided that they can't get enough faster CPUs for the 2800X to make sense, at least not yet. So this has led to some rumours suggesting that they're holding the 2800 back until a later point. Since I've done this video, I've seen a ton of links suggesting that quite a few CPUs are actually going to 4.4 gigahertz. So perhaps 4.275 wasn't cherry picked after all, maybe the average is around about 4.2 but there are chips out there that are capable of doing 4.4. And if that's the case, if 4.4 is actually the top end here, then obviously we should expect to see these come with Threadripper at the very least. So AMD right now should be stockpiling most of these better chips to launch with Threadripper later in the year. But a few days ago we saw this rumour, Friday April the 20th it was, Jim Anderson the SVP has hinted that AMD might actually release a 2800X CPU at a later date. And then another one a couple of days ago, over at the Enquirer, AMD plans a 2800X CPU to take on Intel's 8-core Coffee Lake chips. And this kind of makes sense to me now. Now that I've thought about it, and this rumour that we saw over at PC World a week ago, where we saw this documentation of an 8 plus 2 processor. So this will be 8 cores and 2 graphics cores, Coffee Lake S. I mean, we've known about this 8 core CPU coming for months now. It's just yet more confirmation. But when it came to the 2700X, I hadn't really thought it through properly. I was looking at it from a point of view of AMD really should have released the best they possibly can now. Let's just call that the 2800X with a 4.4 gigahertz top end. But if they don't have enough chips out there, what kind of price would that come in at? And just how much better can it be? We're talking small percentages, at best maybe 5% better than the 2700X. And 5% would be a surprise to me. Even though that 5% would have got it closer to the 8700K, it really would have been pretty much what we got anyway. It would have been slightly faster again in multi-threading, slightly faster in single threading, but the reality there is it would simply just have made AMD's more dominant multi-threading even more dominant while still not quite catching up in single thread. The more I thought about it, what makes sense to me is that yes, AMD has decided to hold back a 2800X. This will be on the same level of the Threadripper CPUs. The top 4-5% of dies, maybe even the top 3% that can realistically do 4.4 gigahertz, possibly even 4.5 on single thread. But the important thing here is, when Intel does finally release this 8 core CPU, it's going to be power hungry. They surely will not be able to get 8 cores in there around 4.3 gigahertz but they can maybe squeeze 8 cores in there at 4.1 using a bit more power. What this could come down to is basically the multi-threaded battle. If we go over to Anantec Cinebench 15 multi-threaded benchmark and we take the 8700K here at 1395 points, let's just do 1395 divided by 6 which gives us 232.5 and then multiply that for 8 with an 8 core and you're up at 1860 points, you're just about ahead of the 2700X. If Intel is able to get 4.3 gigahertz on this 8 core, then AMD are gonna need to get a 2800X out there. This would of course be at the same 4.3 gigahertz multi-threading, which I do not believe Intel will do. So what we actually need to do here is divide that by 4.3 and then multiply by 4.1 and you're getting 1773 points 
That would be a 4.18 core CPU. We know that Cinebench is pretty good for AMD these days. So even though Intel, maybe with a 4.1 gigahertz 8 core, cannot quite reach the 2700X, it's gonna be faster in other multi-threaded benchmarks. So if AMD can get out there with maybe a 4.4, even a 4.3 gigahertz 2800X on all cores, then we could be looking at possibly the tightest multi-threaded battle we have seen in a very, very long time. Intel are still gonna be able to hold on to this single threaded advantage they have. And given the maturity of the process, you know, they maybe even get five gigahertz on a single thread with these incoming eight core parts. So that's how I am analysing this whole Zen versus Coffee Lake thing. We thought the excitement was the beginning of the year and we got a little bit more competition there. But later on in the year, watching these two go head to head on core count, that could certainly end up being a bit more interesting than maybe what most of us assume today. Regarding Threadripper, that one is going to be quite beastly for sure and Skylake X is going to be in real trouble in around three or four months time. Now I talked a little bit about Nvidia, it's so difficult to get anything out of this company these days. AMD are incredibly leaky. We basically had the rise in 2700X's performance well over a month before it released. Nvidia on the other hand, complete opposite. Trying to get any kind of information on Nvidia is extremely difficult. Over at WCCF, we've got a rumour on GTX 1180's specs, performance, price and release date. Note that this is preliminary, but it's 1180 based on the Turing architecture and 12 nanometer process. And this really shouldn't be too long before it arrives, which makes the lack of information even stranger. But analysing this one, apparently the 1180 will be powered by a 104 class GPU codenamed GT104. Now a 104 class Nvidia GPU would generally have a 256 bit memory bus. Your GTX 680, your GTX 980 and your GTX 1080. That's your four class of GPU which used to be reserved for Nvidia's mid-range before they started charging high-end prices for it. But I found this one interesting, with the GPU measuring around about 400 square millimetres. That's 3584 CUDA cores and a 256-bit GDDR6 memory interface. And also quite interesting with a claim of 8 to 16 gigabytes, claiming around a 1.6 gigahertz base clock and a boost of around 1.8. And obviously nothing of this is confirmed, but the TDP expected to be around 170 to 200 watts. Now most of this I would probably have guessed at. What I would say though is around 400 square millimetres. That's probably a little bit larger than what I would expect out of a 12 nanometer chip that only had a 256 bit memory. Now granted it's got a lot more CUDA cores, however CUDA cores scale better than memory buses and with the drop to 12 nanometer I would think possibly around 380 or even 370 square millimetres would be more like it. Assuming all this is true here, what we're really looking at is what Nvidia did between the move from Kepler to Maxwell. If you remember with Kepler, they started off with the GTX 680, which is a 104 class GPU. Then afterwards, they moved on to the 780, which had the much larger 384 bit memory bus. So this was a much larger GPU. The equivalent of that 780 or 780 Ti or Titan or Titan Black would be today's 1080 Ti or Titan X P trying to remember all these bloody titans. But getting back to that whole Kepler era, the 680, the 780, Nvidia then followed up of course with Maxwell, the 980, which as I mentioned was another 104 class GPU. But the GTX 980 was quite a bit larger than the GTX 680. So if we just take this at face value, assume this is all true, we would be looking at a repeat of what Nvidia did between Kepler and Maxwell. A larger 104 class GPU, you're gonna squeeze in more shaders in there, but keep the same memory bus because the move to GDDR6 will allow for the higher bandwidth. Looking at this 8 or 16 gigabytes, I would be very, very surprised if it went as far as 16 gigabytes. So I would stick with 8 there. And regarding the base and boost clock, this looks fairly conservative to me. I would go 1.8 and 2 gigahertz and possibly even expect more. And again, pick a number in between there. That's your TDP. Earlier on in the year, I said, you know what? Nvidia could just shrink GP102 the current 1080 Ti, drop the price down to 500 bucks and that thing would sell like hotcakes. But in this current environment with miners buying cards, even though it has calmed down a lot this past month or two, if something faster, more efficient gets out there, miners are gonna be all over it. 
And it's just making it absolutely impossible to tell exactly what it is that NVIDIA is up to here. What I would say is this though, if this kind of performance is true, a bit faster than the Titan XP, then you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay 1080 Ti prices plus for this graphics card, even though it would be an 1180 mid-range class GPU with an even faster one coming before the end of the year. The second thing to take away from this would be that AMD are in incredible trouble unless they have also got something up their sleeve. I will Consider that towards the end of this video. Now next up for the rumour mill over at Gamers Nexus and a couple of interesting videos talking about memory. The first one was this one in Hardware News that AMD were researching DDR5 and HBM for CPUs. And this is what Steve said. Our present understanding is that AMD is working with at least one memory supplier to establish an R&D lab at AMD's Austin campus. And this lab's entire purpose is to research DDR5 and develop DDR5 uh, for the next generation of system memory. Now I found that interesting as I had also heard a rumour of AMD and DDR5 in the far future, around the 2021 time frame with AMD's Genoa. Now if you follow AMD server stuff, we can see here Epic, which we all know about. That was of course based on Zen. The Zeppelin dies on 14 nanometers. Coming next is Zen 2, 7 nanometers, and that's called Roam. And then after that, and this is an official AMD slide, so we can take this as truth. After that, Milan comes, they're calling it Zen 3, although they do change these numbers around an awful lot, but Milan is coming around 2020 on 7 nanometers plus. Genoa comes after Milan in 2021. We've heard rumours of them working on Zen 5, and that is probably it. But the rumour I have heard, from a source I have zero reason to doubt, is that with Genoa in 2021, AMD will also support DDR5. So if you think about them researching it now, just in time for 2021, and also what I've been told, a new socket. That wouldn't be really surprising. The move to DDR5 would certainly require a new socket. This all lines up pretty well with what we know. And with Steve over at Gamers Nexus, getting this rumour from from memory guys. And I'm not going to give away any of my sources, but the DDR5 rumour that I heard did not come from the memory guys. Two different sources talking about a similar kind of thing. You can pretty much take it as granted that AMD will be first to DDR5 just after 2020. Some of the other stuff I've heard on the server front is kind of mind blowing, but I'm going to leave that one for a future video. Now Steve also talked about HBM for CPUs in this one. That wouldn't be a massive surprise to me. I haven't heard any rumours of it, but there's no reason why AMD would not go down that route. It's something that I will analyse at some point in the future. So I'm pretty much in complete agreement with this rumour. However, yesterday Steve was talking about AMD moving to 9 gigabits per second GDDR5 on an upcoming GPU. They're supposed to eventually make a smaller Vega discrete GPU. So I don't know if they'd use it for that or if they're sticking with HBM because they're ramping up their HBM production as well. As you saw there, Steve speculates that perhaps there will be a GDDR5 Vega. Now I found this one interesting because my information from a different source suggested to me that AMD was done with GDDR5. So this one should be quite interesting to follow. Now I'm going to finish this one up with getting back to graphics. And the suggestion that perhaps it won't be as one-sided as we're all fearing. Earlier on in this month, Charlie over at Semi-Accurate with three C's? He launched an article talking about the PlayStation 5. Now I'm not a subscriber so I don't know for sure but from reading around some people were talking about Navi GPUs in the PlayStation 5 and coming by the end of this year. Now this seems pretty early to me and looking at this slide from last year we were led to believe that Vega would be 14 nanometers and then 14 nanometer plus with Navi coming on 7 nanometers. However today we know that we got Vega on 14 with another Vega incoming at 7 nanometers with Navi then following that at 7 nanometers. So this puts this 7 nanometer Vega squarely in 2018, with Navi probably coming next year. But that doesn't necessarily mean that AMD isn't working very closely with Sony to bring Navi to game consoles later on this year. And if you remember back to this slide, was it 2016? Where we just got Polaris, Vega still hadn't arrived, and you remember Navi talking about scalability and also next gen memory. The scalability was the interesting one for me, as I assumed that this was the start of the whole chiplets architecture where you have perhaps your front end, your scheduler as one chip with perhaps your shader engines as you can see here as separate chiplets. So you might imagine all this stuff, your ACs, your front end, all your multimedia stuff and then maybe four chiplets instead of having it all as one monolithic GPU. This is kind of what I'm expecting from Navi. But last month, I got some pretty interesting information on a server card based on Vega which would come in either one 
two or three GPU options in one card. And I was reminded of this article over at Video Cards well over a year ago now, where they talked about Vega 10X2, which was supposedly coming the second half of 2017. Well, that clearly didn't happen. But also remember this one, Vega 20, targeted for the second half of 2018, which incidentally, I have heard, the new Vega is definitely coming this year, with four stack HBM2 at one terabytes per second. And this lines up with my source, although this could probably have been guessed at. But looking at these two slides together, and this Vega 10X2, and my source also claiming two and three GPUs, you Vega 10 cards coming. I just found that one fairly interesting. Putting it all together, we kind of see what happened. We had Polaris Vega followed by Navi. This was the two year ago roadmap. One year ago we had Vega, we had Vega on 14 nanometers and then Navi on 7. And now we've got Vega moved on to 7 followed by Navi. Semi accurate talking about Navi, but this could also be a Vega based chiplet architecture. My information says that this is only possible because of the Infinity Fabric. So we're not talking Crossfire here. We are talking a true multi-chip graphics architecture coming from AMD before the end of this year. It's not Navi, it is based on Vega, and it may just be good enough to get them right back into the fight with Nvidia. But it will of course come down to just how power efficient these two or three GPUs can be. And the final source I'm going to use here is over at Fudzilla, who said that AMD's Navi is no high-end GPU. And one or two other sources in the tech press jumped onto this and said, you know, is AMD just giving up on the high-end again? But this is not how we should be looking at it. AMD isn't giving up on the high-end. AMD is giving up on large chips. This was always what the master plan was all about. If you can combine smaller GPUs as one, then the manufacturing advantages are crystal clear. But it's unlikely to be a free lunch. There will be a power cost, but that can be offset by another major advantage of the chiplet based architecture. I'm going to talk about that in a future video. But hopefully putting all this together, we can sort of figure out that yes, the master plan is well and truly on its way. It's actually coming this year with Vega 10, Vega 20. I don't know the exact number, but there's going to be a two or three GPU graphics card. Possibly the three GPU one will only be seen in servers, but I think we'll see on the desktop seven nanometer dual Vega graphics card to take on Nvidia's 1100 series. Whether or not that's going to be enough, we're just going to have to wait and see. Right, but let's me done with this one. Something a little bit different. Pretty interesting for me to analyse what the rest of these guys are saying and then adding my own information, which of course I don't know for sure if it's correct or not. I mean, all of this I've just talked about could be completely wrong, but just basing my own information against these other guys' information, you can at least start to build a picture of what may be coming not only this year, but in the years to follow. But I'm done with this for now. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out my video description for links to a bunch of stuff, including my Amazon links. And I'll be back with another video early on in May. I'll catch you later, guys. Thank <laughs> you.